All right, welcome back everybody. Uh, this is web room number four. Uh, and our next talk is Restoring Native Aquatic Vegetation, the State of the Field with Dan Larkin and Mike Verhoeven. Uh, for those of you who are just joining, if you have any questions for our presenters during their talk, please feel free to click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and you'll be able to type out your questions there. Uh, you might need to hover your mouse over the screen for a second or two to make that appear. Um, and again, feel free to do that throughout the presentation, not just at the end. Uh, but without any further ado, I will hand things over to Dan and Mike. Great. Thanks, Pat. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for coming to our talk. This is really um, Mike's talk. This is uh, Mike Verhoeven is a doctoral candidate in conservation sciences. Um, I should have introduced myself. I'm Dan Larkin, an associate professor and extension specialist in fisheries, wildlife and conservation biology and with MACERC. And Mike will be presenting work from his dissertation, um, some e experimental results he has to show you today. So I'll turn it over to Mike. Alrighty, thank you very much, Dan. Um, I'd like to sort of continue um, the sort of the, uh, the administrative here at the beginning right away by thanking our funders and partners, including um, everyone you see here listed at the bottom of the slide. Um, the many uh, folks that have worked on native uh, plant restorations before me, and everyone that helped on this project. So from Larkin Lab techs, uh, Larkin Lab members, our postdocs and graduate students, uh, as well as some detectors volunteers uh, that over the years have joined me in the field. Uh, all right, so let's jump right into it. What I'm going to talk to you today about is an experiment that uh, we've been running since the summer of 2018, and the whole point of the experiment was to determine when and where invasive plant removals could induce native plant community recovery. So when can invader removals be a means of restoring native plants? I'm going to start with uh, set the setup of the work, give you some background, understand why these questions are important. Um, we'll discuss some methodological bits, especially with regards to seeding and propagules, and uh, we'll end with some of our findings. So there are many reasons to want a healthy submerged plant community in the littoral areas of our lakes. From the habitat that they provide for invertebrates, food they provide for waterfowl, to the ability of aquatic plants to bottle up excess nutrients that might make their way into our water bodies, uh, healthy native aquatic vegetation is developed as a common goal for managers of our lakes. And one of the threats to thriving native vegetation um, is invasive species. Here you can see curly leaf pondweed, um, one of two invasive plants that we're going to talk about today. Um, and there's a little timeline there at the top for its establishment and expansion in the state. But I want to emphasize that this plant um, has been uh, sort of attributed with the uh, ability to dominate over native plants. Um, and especially in uh, eutrophic systems, it has this association with eutrophic or green um, sort of algal dominated systems. Um, another plant that we're going to talk about today is Eurasian water milfoil. Similarly, here is a, a timeline of its establishment in North America and Minnesota. Um, and similar to curly leaf pondweed, it's known to dominate over native plant communities and also has this high tolerance to um, algal dominated states or, or high productivity or high um, eutroph eutrophied lakes. All right, so let's unpack that invader dominance over native species just a little bit. Um, the threat of our invasive plants to our native plant communities is often underscored by our observation of invader dominance. But we should be critical of ourselves here um, because while the pattern is obvious, uh, the means by which it arises may not be so simple. And those processes, the things that have driven the native species declines, need to be manipulated in order to restore the native vegetation. Simply removing the invasive plant um, where it is not the culprit for driving native declines won't elicit native recovery. Instead, removing the process that has driven those native plants into decline should elicit that native response. And indeed, in other ecosystems, we see that often by removing the true driver of those native declines, um, you can actually allow the native plants to outcompete the invader once that sort of pressure is off of them. So let's bring it back to Minnesota and drop the manatees off of our slides. 
and think about managing this lake that you see um, on my slide um, for native plant, a healthy native plant community. So a manager would be sort of facing a challenging conundrum here uh, as they try to restore a native plant community in this lake. First, they might consider increasing the water clarity. So improving water quality can clear up the water. And we know that more light on those native plants or clearer water in our lakes is associated with more uh, healthy aquatic vegetation. And so they might take on that water clarity issue. Next, they might take on that invasive plant. Now, remember the caveat that I just dropped about the um, true driver of how natives decline. But often we think to ourselves, well, we saw the native species decline under canopy of the invader. And so removing that dominant invader should allow those natives to reestablish. And a manager with a, a bit of sort of foresight is going to be thinking, where will that native plant community come from? Um, they're thinking about how those native plants are going to reestablish in this lake, whether it's from seed or transplants, et cetera. And so <clears throat> of those three, what do we often do to manage a lake like this? We target the invader. And why? Well, often it is um, one, of the, one of the best sort of established modes of changing that invader's dominance in the lake. Um, it certainly controls the nuisance caused by overabundant invasive species. Um, and it's often this tangible action that's well supported by research, especially with curly leaf and Eurasian when it comes to herbicide based management strategies. And so we target that invader and we think that if that invader was having this negative effect on natives, then we'll elicit this native regrowth. But as I mentioned, this relationship um, this idea that in removing the invader will elicit a response from the natives uh, hinges on the fact that competition was driving those native species to low abundance. But as we discussed, many other things can also give rise to this pattern of invader dominance. So we can't necessarily pin the problem on the invader. This is a classic case of pattern is not equal to process or correlation is not equal to causation. So thinking about this system and all these things that could be suppressing native plant communities, we start to um, take on uh, or develop an experiment or a set of hypotheses that we can um, quantify the arrows in this figure on the left of your screen. And so I'd like to focus on that competition question. If competition was indeed uh, the primary means of interaction between these plants, uh, invasives and natives, we would expect that for trajectory of invasion, invaded plant communities would be sliding toward invader dominance. And then on the other end of this equation, when we remove the invader, whether it's via an herbicide treatment or hand pulling it from these plots, we'd expect those natives to rebound from that release from competition. <clears throat> and we can look to some um, ecological theories to help understand why this or how this competition interaction should play out. Um, the, the, the first thing I have here is that in, in ecology, we have a central tenet that complete competitors cannot coexist. If these two plants are serving the exact same role in the ecosystem, having the exact same niche, which is an ecological word, uh, essentially for the, the spot that a, a species has carved out in the system to make its living, if these species have complete competitive overlap or complete niche overlap, they can't coexist. However, if these species are able to use a slightly different um, sort of niche or carve out a slightly different living, um, they should be able to coexist in these systems. So with our two species of interest, curly leaf pondweed and Eurasian water milfoil, we can start to think about the niches of those species to inform how strong that competition likely is with native plants. We were able to do this using data collected likely from many of you in the room. Um, and what that process looked like was aggregating many, many observations of native and invasive plants across the state and constructing uh, niches. And those niches, we used a computer to build them, but they're essentially a multi-dimensional uh, place in the environment that a species makes its living. We compared the niches of those invaders, to the native species, and I won't delve into the statistics or how we did it here, but the point is shown in the, in the pictures on the right. We found curly leaf pondweed 
seemed to be succeeding by avoiding competition with native species, growing darker, deeper, and earlier. And on the other hand, uh, Eurasian water milfoil seemed to be succeeding in our lakes by getting right in there and throwing elbows um, with native species, having strong niche overlap with the natives. So that brings me back to my schematic again. And I wanna add in one more component, and that is that this niche partitioning could prevent competition between invaders and natives. <clears throat> and so with this model in mind, uh, we designed an experiment to try to quantify the arrows that I'm showing uh, in this little schematic. What we did was went out into the field and we manipulated sites that were dominated by an invasive species by either removing the invader, adding propagules, and I'll unpack that word propagules here in a moment, um, or adding propagules and conducting invader removals. Then we followed those plots through time, asking how the native plant community changed. <clears throat> now recall, we don't have light in that experimental design anywhere, and we think that light is important. So the way that we've manipulated the light in our experiment is placed our plots um, in five lakes across a gradient of productivity, which is sort of synonymous with water clarity in this case, and not synonymous, but um, is a proxy for water clarity in this case. And we also, within each of those lakes, varied the depth at which our experiment was repeated. So we repeated each experimental unit four times at um, shallower and shallower depths to allow in even the most turbid light lakes, the most dark lakes, some light to be in some of our plots. And so there was this experiment designed to quantify each of the arrows in this figure. And I promise you I would unpack propagule supply just a little bit, so I'd like to do that now. Um, and when we talk about propagule supply for native plants and adding propagules into our experiment, we need to consider the fact that um, Invasive species, I'm sorry, uh, aquatic plants have sort of two primary modes of, of reproduction. First is produ producing seed, and second is producing vegetative propagules. Um, some of you might know or be familiar with the term turion. Many of our pond weeds have a turion, which is um, just a specialized structure that allows vegetative reproduction. So I use propagule because it encompasses both these vegetative propagules and seed propagules that all help these plants reproduce. And so with all of that, we have this experiment designed to quantify the arrows that you see in the schematic on the left. So over the course of 2018 to 2021, this year, we executed a ton of work. Um, every year, uh, visiting each of the plots that were uh, randomly selected as removals to remove the invasive plants from them. And we would move around through the lake on scuba equipment using, and you can just barely see it in this photo, um, a five by five meter PVC plot that helped us color within the lines, if you will, making sure that we removed only the invasive plant from within our experimental plots. <clears throat> and then in the final year, uh, 2021, last year, we uh, did a seed edition and a vegetative propagule edition. And so here's where I'd like to take a little tangential ride and tell you my first short story that I'm considering uh, publishing, not really, as a children's book. Uh, and that is the challenge of adding propagules. So we devised a strategy to use seed to conduct our propagule editions. And our reasoning was that previous work using transplanting um, was primarily done at the small scale. So it was one meter, two meter, three meter plots um, where plugs of plants would be transplanted directly into the sediment in one way or another with direct plugs or in benthic mats, et cetera. Um, and the challenge with that is that lake restoration is usually happening at the lake level. And so we wanted to think about a propagule addition method that could be scaled easily to the lake level. So we uh, landed on seeding. And we found that seeds were easily collected, they were easy to store, and they were easy to plant. What you can see in this dish here is um, a small chunk of the more than 16,000 seeds that I was able to collect 
in a single collection period of about five hours. <clears throat> but we might go forward many slides. I feel like I just clicked too many times. Here we go. What we found was that those seeds uh, had high survival through collection and storage. Uh, keep in mind the, the plot you're seeing here, which is the um, viability um, in green and the non-viable portion of um, the collection of four species along the x-axis, um, you know, ranging from 30% to 60% doesn't seem that great, but when you consider that I could collect 16,000 seeds in five hours, that's really pretty good. However, what we found was that these seeds were tremendously hard to break dormancy on. And for anyone that's not worked with seeds in the past, um, seeds have a unique ecology where each species has evolved to have very certain triggers, very particular triggers that will induce the germination of that seed. And what you're seeing in this figure now is for those same four species shown in rows that even in the right hand column, which um, was the, the, the group which we treated with scarification, which is SC, and gibberellic acid, which is a germination inducing um, chemical, even for those groups we had very low germination. And even more troublesome was that when we scarified these seeds, we had used a scalpel to scratch the seed coat off of every single one, and it wasn't realistic to do that with 16,000 seeds. So with the seeds, our big hangups were that we had low germinability and that we had trouble um, scaling our seed treatments, scarification and gibberellic acid treatment, up to the level of 16,000 seeds. We tried using sandpaper, we tried using a blender, and in the end, the seeds we added to our plots um, at a rate of 200 seeds per plot um, had only about a 3% germination rate likely. And so we went back to the drawing board and we looked to those vegetative reproductive structures. So here is a turion or a vegetative reproductive structure from flat stem pondweed. And what we found with using vegetative propagules um, to do these propagule additions was that for collection, the vegetative propagules were plentiful and diverse. So over the course of um, about three work days, um, our team was able to collect vegetative propagules, about three quarters of a kilogram to add to each of our experimental plots. Um, and we had great species richness within those um, within those vegetative propagules. And also our propagules seemed pretty resilient to the process of collection, storage, and then um, growth in the lab. So the, the bottom table just shows you um, for 10 of the most abundant species in our um, bags, what the one week and one month survival was. And the overall point here is that vegetative propagules, uh, as I show in this table, um, had a, a higher survival, which allowed us to seed them or add them into our plots at a rate that we thought would, would really cause um, a boost to the native plant community there. So this table is all based on this lab work that I just discussed. Um, and as I said, with transplants, we know a lot about how to do that. There's been some great work from Dr. Newman here at MACERC. Um, there's been some great work from Minnesota DNR that's pictured in the bottom left. Um, and some consultants within the state to try to understand how we can use transplants to reestablish natives after invader control. Um, and the last two columns, seeding and vegetative propagules, uh, I populated based on my experience with them um, and their lab trials. So I think in the future, more work looking at how to use seeding and vegetative propagules is critical. So let's depart from this table and now remember that we we have manipulated these plots by removing invaders. Now we've added vegetative propagules. And so in every year we went back and we resampled the native plant community, uh, or rather the entire plant community in these plots. First by estimating the cover of all species in the plots. We also used hydroacoustics to quantify the structure of the plant community. This is a method I like to call fish findering. And then finally, um, we collected data on the light availability at the sediment, the canopy of plants, and at the surface. 
And we repeated all of this measurement for the period of 2018 to 2021. So from there, I'd like to dive into what we found in our experiment. So based on our analyses to date, um, first we found with respect to the trajectory of invasion and the degree of competition, we found that there were changes in those native plant communities over time. So this plot, while it looks like just spaghetti, um, when plugged into our um, analytical framework and consideration is given for um, the availability of light in these plots um, and the annual change from year to year, um, what we found is that the native plant community was actually slightly increasing over time at a rate of about 8% cover per year for Eurasian water milfoil and decreasing over time at a rate of about 3% per year for curly leaf. Now it's interesting because it actually runs counter to our hypothesis that the greater niche overlap species, Eurasian water milfoil, would likely be a stronger competitor. So we would have expected opposite results for these two species. All right, another thing that we found was that there was rapid recolonization by the invasive species. Um, as you can see in this plot here from Otter Lake, um, where the invader was removed in the right hand side uh, in the year prior, there was quick reestablishment of Eurasian water milfoil. When we look at the data, we see that immediately after removal, we had driven the Eurasian water milfoil abundance down to less than 10% in all of our plots. Um, and one year post-removal, notice the y-axis changes here, one year post-removal, um, you know, we've got anywhere from, from um, 20 percent up to over 50 percent cover of Eurasian water milfoil already. Now this photo I think is a good characterization of what I think is going on. Um, this is a photo of turions and a fragment of Eurasian water milfoil that floated up to the surface when we dropped anchor um, just outside one of our plots. And I think one of the disadvantages of experimental work is we're not manipulating these systems at the same level they might be if we were managing the entire lake. And um, why that's important is that while we've controlled or caused a great sort of um, change in the abundance of the invader in these five by five meter plots where our experiment is being conducted, there is an invasive plant community that exists throughout the remainder of the lake. And in fact, I chose lakes that weren't actively being managed for the invasive plant. And so the reproductive um, ability of the entire lakes population of invader allows that propagule supply to the invasive species to be pretty large. So I think that drove that um, quick recolonization by the invader we had just removed. Next, we saw huge changes in the community structure. And I recall I surveyed these plots with a fish finder. And so um, this next plot, I'm going to these next few slides, I'm going to show you some of those fish finder data. Um, and you can see I've turned our experiment sort of sideways here and aligned it with one sample of that fish finder data. And you can see that in the plots where we removed the invader, there's a far less um, homogeneous canopy of the invader. Uh, and interestingly, when we compare that effect between curly leaf pondweed and Eurasian water milfoil, we can see that um, in the sonar data that's around at the black box, curly leaf pondweeds um, removal in the spring has this strong effect on the um, structural uh, components of the community. But by summer, because curly leaf pondweed has that unique early in the year niche, by summer, um, the structural change that came with removing curly leaf pondweed um, has been all but muted by its seasonal growth. And in contrast, for Eurasian water milfoil, uh, that, that removal of the plant um, persisted, the effect of removing, removing the plant on that structural community persisted through the year. All right, now finally, what we found um, with respect to both the trajectory of invasion and the response to invader reduction is our analysis showed uh, that light was the greatest influencer of uh, native metrics. So when I say native metrics, uh, I'm thinking about percent cover, Simpson's diversity and richness, things like that, these broad native species metrics. Uh, and in fact, what we find with native cover is that light has a 20 times stronger effect 
than your Asian water milfoil in driving that um, native cover, uh, which is pretty significant. All right, so what did we not find in our experimental results? Um, first, we, we did not find strong community responses to invader control in really any of the contexts that we, that we took on in this experiment. Um, next, we did not find that rapid recolonization that happened with the invasives to have a parallel in the native plants. So the invasives rapidly recolonized when we had disturbed these plots by pulling the invader, excuse me, the invader, um, but the natives didn't have that same degree of rapid recolonization. And then finally, um, we did not find an effect of our uh, propagule supply or propagule additions, excuse me, to boosting those native communities. So in summary, um, like I mentioned, we had we had no overall native plant response to these uh, manipulations that we did, whether it's propagule additions or invader removal. Um, but I think an important caveat to put here is that our our future analyses will dig into the um, individual native species within these communities, because while we don't see an overall native plant community change, what we might be observing is gains for certain species. And, and sort of synchronous losses for other species. For example, um, plants that are disturbance tolerant might um, be recolonizing as we go through and pull Eurasian water milfoil, um, while plants that are not disturbance tolerant might be fading out um, as we pull Eurasian water milfoil from these plots and disturb that sediment. <clears throat> the second point here is that the single most important factor for natives was light availability. Um, in a management context, this really supports the, um, the need for efforts to improve and maintain water quality. And the reason I say water quality is, as I mentioned, water quality um, in most of our state is very closely tied to light availability in our lakes. Um, and I wanna say one more thing about that light availability is that um, we have these light data that we collected. Uh, and what I expect to find in sort of a different analytical framework is that um, removing the invader, in particular Eurasian water milfoil, removes a very light absorbing canopy. And so um, we should be able to tie uh, that native uh, um, affiliation with high light availability to these places where we've increased light availability by reducing milfoil. All right, then the last point here, um, active revegetation efforts have succeeded elsewhere. As I mentioned, Dr. Newman's work um, and work from other work from within the state as well as across uh, the US. Um, and they seemed promising our seed and in particular our vegetative propagule additions um, seem promising from our lab quantification, um, but they failed field application. We did not induce that growth that we expected. Um, by adding those vegetative propagules. And so the bottom line is that this experiment, which was um, sort of a, a very close quantification at the local level of the effects of invader removal on native plant community, doesn't show us evidence to support the idea that invasive plant control was a good means of native restoration. So what does that mean for us? Are we dead in the water? Is all of this native restoration work futile? I would argue that it is absolutely not. Um, we know that there are many factors that could be influencing uh, the, the abundance or the, the diversity, et cetera, of these native plant communities. And so thinking about those other factors and designing work in the future um, to target those and quantify the effects are really important. One example I'll leave you with is that if these invasive species have changed the habitat where they've established, let's say they've changed some chemistry component of the sediment, they may have um, long lasting effects that we wouldn't see in a four year experiment of their removal. It might take five, six, seven years to change that chemical effect that I've hypothesized um, in order to get those natives to reestablish there. Um, all right, so with that, that's all I have to talk about. I would be happy to answer any questions we might have.
Thanks, Mike. I've got a, a couple of questions that came in during the talk. Um, as a reminder, everyone, if you are looking to ask questions of Mike or also Dan and Ray are here as well, and they can jump in, uh, just hit that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and you'll be able to type in your answers there and I'll read them off. Uh, so one question kind of Mike from sort of how you went about this, where do you source the vegetative propagules from that you are using? Yeah, great question. We sourced all of our vegetative propagules from one lake that was suggested to us by a regional um, DNR staff. Um, and we collected those propagules um, in August. And um, what that allowed for us was the species that we were finding were commonly um, fragmented already. And we were focusing on fragments that had adventitious rooting. So things that would be uh, likely to um, likely to reestablish if we were to plant them into our plots. And I'll just add to that that one of the key criteria that Mike used is um, that that was an uninvaded lake. It was obviously you wouldn't want to go to an invaded lake and collect a bunch of propagules since you'd have likely have cross contamination. All right, uh, then kind of a little question about experimental design um, and kind of the, the germination of seeds. Uh, do you think a longer time frame might have uh, increased the germination success or also possibly broadcasting them and kind of just letting them lie naturally? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so if I was a sharper grad student, I would have spent more time in the literature uh, prior to executing these seed experiments. Um, and what I would have found had I done that um, is that the dormancy breaking treatments that they've that have been established for many of our aquatic plants are are sort of like wildly are wildly specific. Uh, and what I mean by that is that certain species, um, might require a stepwise increase in temperature before they're planted in order to get them to germinate. Um, other species might uh, require anoxic conditions and the same stepwise treatment, or another species might require anoxic conditions and a, um, a single step. And if you give it a stepwise increase in temperature, it won't germinate. Um, so the, the idea that longer storage times or longer sort of dormancy times um, can help uh, with breaking dormancy is absolutely um, sort of out there as a, a mechanism of dormancy break in other species. I'm not sure if it would be relevant to the species that we were using, um, but that's a great question. And I think there's a second piece there that I might be sort of stepping over. I'll just add that, you know, in other forms of restoration, terrestrial restoration, wetland restoration, you know, seeding is a very common and well-established and effective practice. And we're just sort of, uh, these submerged aquatic species are so understudied, relatively speaking, that we just haven't, there's a lot of art to it that hasn't been worked out. Um, and so I think it's really important for there to be more work in this area so that these seeding approaches can become more effective. And to the other point about, you know, what if you sort of broadcast the seed and wait, I think that's entirely likely that there could be some um, effects of seeding that could take a while to show up because these uh, seeds are, you know, they're fickle little creatures. And so it could depend on kind of the right weather conditions, light conditions, et cetera, in a given year. And so you can see seed that's put out and, you know, just sort of sits there and doesn't do much in other systems. And then a couple of years later shows itself. So that's, you know, with a, a grant funded project or a um, PhD project, as in Mike's case, those time constraints are a big limit on you know, being able to generalize to what this would be like in practice. All right, I'm gonna tee up a little bit for you here, Mike. Uh, first off, has this experiment been written up and published or do you have a date of when it will be out so that people can read up on it and what's next for this research? Yeah, that's a great question. So we, well, I'll say this. 
I am finishing my PhD next year, uh, and therefore this experiment will be written up prior to that. Um, my hope uh, is that that'll that publication um, will be sometime, you know, this winter uh, after the beginning of the year, I'm sure. Um, and so, yes, it will be written up. It's not there yet. The second piece of it, uh, what's next for this research? Um, I alluded to this a little bit it, in the talk was at first when I showed you these analyses today, I used um, sort of response metrics for the native community that are sort of broad reaching. So I use things like native richness, native cover, and it's this aggregation of all of the um, sort of ebbing and flowing of every individual species in the community. And so one thing that's next for this data set is rather than treating that community as just a whole community um, with all these small moving parts that really just make a big, um, a big pie in the end, we're going to think about every piece of that pie and looking at species um, within there that may have had positive effects, negative effects, effects, et cetera, um, from these treatments. So that's what's what's next within this experiment. Great. Um, so going back to some of the the kind of issues you ran into, you mentioned that there was the difficulty with invasive propagule pressure post removal in your plots. Do you think statewide data sets of lake-wide millfield treatments, um, such as fluoridone, would allow you to challenge some of these conclusions or kind of see a more picture there? Yep, absolutely, absolutely. So one of the one of the things that we I, I teased you with that picture of Minnesota, and I said we had all of these data sets for plant observation across the state. Um, one of the things that we have not yet done is dig into that data set as a um, as a management data set. So asking what happens in the native plant communities within that large statewide plant data set when we manipulate um, Eurasian water milfoil or curly leaf abundance with um, herbicide or mechanical management. Uh, and so this reproductive effect of the lake-wide population potentially swamping out my plot level manipulation um, can sort of be overcome by using these large statewide data sets where indeed management often does target the entire population of the invader in the lake. Let's see. Um, we've got a couple questions kind of about some of these, some more of these implications for management that you've talked about. Um, for lakes that are consistently treating for milfoil or curly leaf pondweed and are using really targeted treatments, um, would they then be leaving, are they leaving behind kind of bare ground under those treatments? And is there something they should be doing to correct that or to promote native growth? Um, we've got a couple questions about that relating to both herbicide treatments and mechanical harvesting. Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic question. Um, so what we found in our experiment was that um, as as many in the room and, and that are in the webinar are probably aware, um, you can have invader dominance with a, sort of an understory of native plant community, or you can have invader dominance with really a depauperate native plant community. It's just that one invasive species growing there. Um, and what we found was that when we controlled the invader in places where there was an established native plant community, um, that established native plant community um, didn't respond strongly. So they didn't decline when we removed the invader. Uh, they didn't also, they also didn't increase when we removed the invader. And, and in cases where there was this depauperate native plant community under the canopy of invader, what we found was that in, invader removals were just that, they were invader removals. Um, and so they did indeed leave behind sort of open space. Um, and some, some management implications of that or, or what we can do about that. Um, I think that the significance of light in um, our native community metrics or the, the relevance of light to driving those native communities would suggest that if we can work on water clarity in our lakes, um, and tie that work together with invader management, we're more likely to get reestablishment of native plants um, upon removal. And that works, or that, that concept um, is supported by work, um, for example, by Dr. Newman and Josh Kanopic, um, showing that transplants 
uh, work best, transplants after invader removal work best in um, shallower plots that have more light availability. So um, I hope that answers the question to, to some degree. And, and I think a way to think about this, you know, in terms of the implications for areas that are um, being treated with herbicide is, you know, like Mike said, sort of thinking about the capacity for native recovery, because the best way to get native revegetation, since it's so difficult through seeding or propagule addition, is for the lake plant community that's already there to do it itself. So you can imagine situations where there is still a robust native community that can recolonize those areas, and you have small areas of Eurasian water milfoil or other invasives that are being treated. And in those situations, you'd expect a lot of potential for it to be the natives that are coming back into those areas versus situations where you have you know, really large scale invader dominance, you have less of those natives there to recover. And there still might be benefit to invasive species control for nuisance reduction or, or other management goals, but there's just kind of not the grist for the mill there in terms of the native plant communities you get a lot of native revegetation. Uh, the point about light availability actually leads into to another question I've got here. Um, the, it seems like there could be a real benefit for lake managers having some sort of chart or tool that identifies native plant restorations um, and when they would be successful based on summer secchi averages within lakes. Is that something you think you could tease out or potentially that could kind of dovetail from this research? Yeah, and I, I'm going to take that and run with it just a little bit. And I think that what we can what we can infer from this work is potentially a threshold of light availability at the sediment where native plants did better, um, or maybe it's a linear relationship. Um, what I think is critical to remember is that in any lake, um, you, unless the water clarity is extremely low, let's say less than, less than 10 centimeters, you will have some depth zones of that lake that have sufficient light for native growth. And so thinking about um, sort of the zones of the lake that might be appropriate for, for reestablishment of native vegetation based on the um, lake's water clarity sort of plugged into the depth of the lake, if that makes sense. So it's the cross of those two things, the water clarity and, um, and the depth that you're gonna try to do that revegetation effort. Um, that our work really shows is, is important. So that those two factors give you how much light there is. And I'll just add to that, that you know, Mike alluded to the statewide data set that he's also now analyzing. What he presented today you know, is, is experimental results so we can deal with these, you know, control these different factors and get more at causation. But that statewide data set has a lot of power because you can identify so many different scenarios across the state where you had uh, various combinations of light availability and native plant diversity and invader abundance and control effort. And so, um, you know, that data set and Mike's, the analyses he'll be working on over the next year can really, um, hopefully reveal a lot of those relationships of where you see um, the better, what are the scenarios where you see those better outcomes in terms of native response. Yeah, and just one final thing to close on that is that I absolutely do think that out of that statewide data set, plus these experimental results, um, we can put together a bit of a decision matrix on what condition is my lake in and based on this statewide data set, plus this experimental result, um, what might I expect to happen if I'm controlling an invader or what might I want to, to manage or manipulate if I want those native plants back? All right, I think we've got time for one last question. Uh, your project focused on species that are often still mixed in with other native species. Uh, do you think the insights from this project would still hold with an invader like Starry Stonewort that tends to grow in more dense aggregations and really exclude other species? Yeah, um, that, is a great, that is a great question. Um, so our lab has done some work looking at the effects of starry stonewort on native plant communities. Um, 
And I think that what when when we pose a question like what we just asked, we still run the risk of that pattern versus process. So we do see starry stonework growing in other plant communities in certain places or in mixed communities in certain places. Um, but we also do, do see it in these very dense dominating stands. And so I think that 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 same paradigm of what happens when we control um, an invader based on what the native plant community is in the understory would fit. And I think with, you know, let's say we had some magical um, herbicide where we could wipe out starry stonewort. Um, I would say that in the places where starry stonewort has become this sort of benthic mat and there's nothing else growing there, you would be left with open ground below the starry stonewort um, and still natives would need to reestablish in some way. Um, and in the places where starry stonewort is mixed in, um, I'm not sure that those native plant communities would res respond real strongly to the loss of a single member of that mixed community. I, ho I hope that makes sense. And I just add one last thing um, is, you know, I, I think of this as kind of a two stage process. And I think there are a lot of situations where invader control is probably necessary, but not sufficient to induce native recovery. So that in a, say, with a dense aggregation of starry stonework before you can possibly reestablish um, native diversity, it's likely going to be necessary to reduce the starry stone work. But if you just reduce the starry stone work and stop there, it might be insufficient. So thinking of it as kind of a two-stage process of invader removal, but then what's next? All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, as a reminder for everyone, if you have questions, uh, just click that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and you can type those in. Uh, I've got a few that have come in here. Uh, the first one, Mike, was related to kind of the, the propagating or, or lack thereof. Uh, do you think it would be feasible, rather than trying to use propagules to transplant mature native plants into some of these, these plots, do you think that would have a higher rate of success? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I I absolutely think that that would have a higher rate of success. And I'm basing that on um, previous published work that has shown that mature plants can be established well um, from transplanting. I still feel, so while that would be useful in this experimental context, I still think that experiments designed to um, advance our knowledge of seed or vegetative propagules are necessary because those tools are so much more um, scalable. They will will sort of fit more more easily into the manager's toolbox. I think management actions that have to be conducted on the single meter scale are are not fitting the scale at which lakes are managed. If that makes sense. Uh, then I've got I've got a couple questions about me, uh, using mechanical harvesters. Um, first off, do you think that using those could create more propagules of species that they're trying to control and uh, essentially spread increase the spread when they're meant to be keeping it keeping it down? And then, are there potential things that those using mechanical harvesters could do to promote native regrowth in areas that they've just cleared? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Um... Mechanical harvesting can cause fragmentation. And then the worry is that those fragments could be spreading within the lake. And then the second part of it is about um, revegetation once the sort of area has been cleared. So to the first point, um, I don't think there's any doubt that mechanical harvesting can cause fragmentation, that those fragments can settle and, and or spread. And so I think in a very applied management context, in cases where we're really concerned about um, containing the spread within the lake, um, we should be cautious about using mechanical harvesting, um, especially if there's no you know, protective bound. Uh, I, I know that there are some people that have sort of put up um, aquatic curtains or, or um, sediment curtains as a way to contain fragments. And so there are strategies, but I think that 
that recognition that mechanical harvesting causes fragmentation um, is critical and should be considered in any management decision that's going to use harvesting. Um, and then the second part of the question is about reestablishment of native species in that sort of mowed area or, or removed area. And what I would say is that through our experiment, we showed that the community that you get after controlling the invasive species is the community that was living under the canopy already. And so if we're mechanically harvesting areas where there's a native plant community down low, I think it's realistic to expect that that plant community is gonna persist. And then the strategy is to try to um, harvest in such a way that you maximize damage to the invader and minimize damage to that sort of native understory, if you will. Um, and then in places where there's not any vegetation other than the invader, our results would suggest that um, with that mechanical removal, you shouldn't expect some sort of flushing of a native plant community or rushing back into those places. Um, but if you can manage your lake in such a way that you're increasing the light availability at the sediments, that will be the greatest control on whether or not natives come back into those managed areas, regardless of whether the harvesting is happening or not. So reestablishment of those native plants was most closely tied to that light availability. All right, great. Uh, and then next question is, can you explain kind of the mechanism of why we so often see AIS rapidly recolonize disturbed areas as opposed to native species? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so one of the, I guess, sort of central hypotheses about what makes invasive species invasive is um, the disturbance tolerance sort of of invasive species is higher than among others. And uh, this has, is, is often related to how invasive species fall on the heels of humans um, because humans are often disturbing systems. We end up with species following us that are disturbance tolerant. And so um, if, if that indeed is the case for curly leaf pondweed and Eurasian water milfoil, um, they're likely to establish in a disturbed system sort of, or to colonize a disturbed lake, but then they're also more likely to reestablish within a, a lake that they're already living um, in a locale that has been disturbed. And, and so I think if these plants are indeed um, really disturbance tolerant, uh, we shouldn't be sort of particularly surprised that they're rapidly recolonizing their own, um, their own manipulated plots. Perfect, thanks. Uh, just kind of a clarification question here. Uh, can you describe the difference between percent cover and percent frequency of occurrence? Yes, that's a great question. So one of the big components of my research uses these statewide lake management um, or lake survey data sets. Uh, and that's what we built those niche models out of. Uh, and those surveys of whole lakes often give, give um, or, or are summarized in a statistic called frequency of occurrence. And that's basically the percentage of the lake area that has some plant. So you might have 50% occurrence of Eurasian water milfoil. And that says, if we sampled 100 plots in Soup Bowl Lake, we got 50 of those plots where we found milfoil. And that's different from the, um, the cover that we estimate in this local area, uh, because what we're doing is we're actually taking a one meter square and placing it on the lake bottom. And we are estimating this percent cover. So rather than um, frequency of occurrence, percent cover. And we're actually looking down and saying how much of the one meter sort of vertical picture, if you will, is this plant occupying. So 50% Eurasian water milfoil would mean that in that one meter plot, um, Eurasian water milfoil was occupying one half of that area. And so there are very different scales, percent cover um, and frequency of occurrence. And they're also sampled a little differently. Percent cover is that 
estimated coverage, right? It's like a, a three-dimensional square that it's covering or a shape that it's covering. Whereas frequency of occurrence is a, met, uh, a statistic that comes from a point sampling. That was a long-winded answer to say different scales is the primary difference. Uh, it, it's all helpful context. Uh, then I've got another question here uh, that just came in about kind of some experimental design aspects. Um, and wondering about the size of your plots, it looked like in some of the photos, there was milfoil still surrounding some of the plots where it had been removed. Do you think that could have impacted light availability and possibly played into some of the results you were seeing? Yeah, that's a great question. So we designed our experiment basically as big as I could handle. So the five by five meter plot um, consisted of uh, a five by five meter area that was having the um, removal conducted in it. So we removed the milfoil from within that five by five meter area. And then all of the metrics that we, the response metrics we used um, actually came from an area within that was bounded by a half meter on all sides. Uh, and then the light measurement was coming from the center of the plot. And I should say that in the analysis I'm presenting today, the light measurements are um, calculated as a relationship between the depth of the plot and the secchi clarity of the lake. So they're actually like a computed value um, as opposed to the measured values, which we will analyze soon um, and get those sort of canopy um, or shading effects from milfoil. So milfoil at two and a half meters from the measured area, I don't think had a strong shading effect, um, but I do think that this this sort of issue is relevant to the recolonization. So milfoil undoubtedly could be um, senescing or sort of falling over in the fall into our plots. And that could have had the, uh, had the effect of boosting the recolonization. All right, I think we've got time for one more. Um, and this is about uh, potential whole lake treatments. Um, do you think that maybe the whole lake treatment could do something to knock down and reduce the re the reproductive pressure from invasive species and that that might allow a native response as opposed to some of the more targeted treatments? Yep, that's a great, that's a great question. So that's the, um, so uh, two things. One is that uh, what this experiment shows is that at the local scale, which is the scale that which plants are interacting, removing an invasive plant is not gonna elicit a native response. And so if a whole lake treatment was to elicit a native response, um, based on the results of this work, we would expect that it's coming from a different mechanism. For example, maybe the whole lake treatment changed the water clarity of the lake and that elicited the native plant response. Um, but I think a second sort of component that's important to mention here is that we do have this statewide data. Uh, and what we're doing with that is an analysis that asks exactly what um, what this, this person just asked. I, I don't actually see who's asking what, but um, um, we are going to look at whole lake or large scale treatments and ask, did those actual on the landscape management efforts elicit native plant responses? All right, great. Uh, I want to say a quick thank you to, to Mike and to Dan for a great presentation. Uh, this wraps up the last of our concurrent sessions for today, but the showcase is not over yet. Um, I am going to drop the link into the chat. This will take you to the homepage for our poster session. And this is going to work a little differently. Uh, when you go to that page, you'll see you've got access to PDF versions of every poster that's on display. So you can kind of look that over and read it. And then there are separate Zoom rooms for each of those poster presentations. So you can jump into those Zoom meetings and talk to the presenters and ask questions of them. And they're just going to be hanging out, waiting for people to drop in and ask them questions. Uh, those links were also emailed out to you uh, at, with the, at the same email address that you registered for the showcase. So we really encourage you to check out those posters, go visit with the presenters, uh, and really kind of emulate that experience we usually have at the end of the day of an in-person showcase. Uh, but with that, thank you everybody for attending. Thanks again to Mike and Dan, and enjoy the poster session.